everyone well summer seems to linger on and we're trying to enjoy every single moment of it brown thrushes are still visiting our sewage feeder and this week we've spotted a female rose-breasted grosbeak on our nut feeder and then of course goldfinches have exploded in numbers so now i have seven different feeders with different types of food going and i have to refill them every other day but one of the questions that has popped up many times this week is how long to keep your hummingbird feeders up? Well, it all depends on where you are located. So here we're in southern Quebec. Uh, male hummingbirds have already left. I've just seen a female on my zinnia flowers right here. And my latest sighting here in Southern Quebec was on September 20th. So I've made it a rule for myself to keep my hummingbird feeders up until October 1st. And then over the years, I've also talked to many people from different states. And basically uh, in Virginia and Carolinas, they were still seeing and feeding their hummingbirds in mid-October. So there are two things that I can recommend. You can either leave your feeders up for at least two weeks after your last sighting of a hummingbird on your property, or you can check online hummingbird tracking maps to follow their migration. Oh, and one more thing I forgot to mention to you, keeping your feeders up will not stop hummingbirds from migrating. They will migrate whenever they are ready to migrate, whether there are feeders around or not. For years, a near Barton, Maryland has had tree swallows use his four inch Gilbertson's nesting box. Now he's hearing that this type of box is too cramped for them and that it will hamper their wing development and that he should switch to seven by seven inch box to accommodate them. So he's curious to find out whether he should be switching to that and whether tree swallows need a larger box than bluebirds. Hi, Anir. Thank you for your very interesting question regarding the floor space for tree swallow nest boxes. It appears that this issue has created a bit of a stir among swallow box enthusiasts. I did some research on this question and here's my take on it. I tend to agree with you that these Gilbertson 4 inch diameter PVC nest boxes, the ones that have been heavily recommended for whatever reason by some prominent organizations devoted to the cavity nesting songbirds, would appear to provide an inadequate amount of floor space for nestling tree swallows. However, not necessarily for the reason that you suggest. While some nest box managers might feel that one needs a floor space of 7 by 7 inches, as you mentioned, others might feel that that's somewhat of an overkill. After all, the larger the one makes these boxes, the more material is needed, the costlier it gets. One of the top experts in the wild bird business is the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, mainly because they have more paid ornithologists on staff than any other bird organization I know. They recommend a 5 and a half inch square floor. Other websites suggest a minimum 5 by 5 inch floor. While I couldn't find any scientific study focusing specifically on the effects of nest box floor space on wing development in tree swallows, I did find something of far greater interest, perhaps a bit of a game changer for future nest box designs. With our summers getting hotter and hotter due to climate warming, we must be careful to incorporate the impact of higher ambient temperatures on the welfare of nestlings of any kind being raised in nest boxes we provide. That might mean a rethink, not just in ventilation, but also the amount of floor space available to brood, sometimes consisting of as many as seven nestlings. If they can't spread out enough to facilitate the cooling of their bodies in really hot weather, we might just discover that our nest box programs could be creating death traps for the birds we love. So seven inch square floors might not be such a crazy idea after all. Anyway, it certainly bears further discussion. Every fall, I hit garden centers in search of native flowers that never found a home. I'm not sure if you remember, but about five or six years ago, I saved a batch of cardinal flowers, which I was sure were not going to make it at all. Well, out of those three little flowers, I now have three huge beds with so many plants I can't count anymore. And this summer, I found that of all the flowers we have on our property, 
hummingbirds really preferred my cardinal flowers. So I've been absolutely fascinated with this interaction. I've been talking to my colleagues about it and they all now want my cardinal flowers. So I'm digging some up and I'm bringing them over to share this joy. So my challenge for you today is try and find some cardinal flowers to attract hummingbirds next year. Or if you have some, please share them with your friends, neighbors, and your colleagues. The world's penguins are running out of places to go. I'm not just talking about that frozen continent that they live upon. A new study just published in a prestigious scientific journal called Nature Communications by a team headed by Teresa Cole of the University of Copenhagen has shown that penguins and their relatives, the petrels and albatrosses, have the lowest evolutionary rates yet detected in birds. What this means in plain language is that penguins have evolved just about as far as they can go and may be hitting that dead end that we term as extinction. The research team used sophisticated and comprehensive DNA analysis on 17 different orders of birds, which suggested that birds with an aquatic lifestyle and birds that live in cooler climates have lower evolutionary rates than terrestrial bird groups. This means that turkeys and chickens have a higher evolutionary rate than pelicans, cormorants, and waterfowl. And since the flightless penguins enjoy an exclusively aquatic lifestyle in arguably the coldest part of the world, that places them right at the bottom of the list. Interestingly, the researchers reveal that penguins lost their ability to fly in favor of becoming perhaps the most efficient underwater swimmers of all birds about some 60 million years ago. The ancestor to today's modern penguins was the crown penguin, which existed on Earth about 14 million years ago. Sadly, half of today's penguin species are listed as either endangered or vulnerable on the official red list of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. With such a low evolutionary rate driving penguins to adapt and evolve, the warming of planet Earth at such an alarming pace leading to the loss of their icy habitat may well mean the last nail in the coffin for these amazing, lovable birds. Ah, oh, red-winged blackbirds. The males are so gorgeous with their bright red patches on their wings, but their popularity as backyard birds is not so high. For me, spring is here when the first male red-winged blackbird arrives here in March, sits atop our feeder pole and announces its arrival very loudly. They are somewhat migratory. Uh, some populations come to northern states and here in Canada to breed, but others stay put all year around. Here they show up in the big flock together with grackles, cowbirds and starlings. We have a, a huge poplar tree on our property, so in early spring that tree is covered in uh, blackbirds and grackles and so on and they're super loud but after a very long quiet winter we welcome that cacophony females and males are super easy to tell apart males are black with bright red patches on their wings which stand out even more during their breeding season and females are kind of brownish. The issue that some people have is mistaking juvenile and female red-winged blackbirds for female rose-breasted grosbeaks. So two things to look out for. Rose-breasted grosbeaks have really short, stout beaks and they kind of just sit and eat at a feeder, whereas uh, juvenile and female red-winged blackbirds have kind of long, pointy, sharp bills and they tend to fidget, you know, flickering their tail as they try to eat seed at bird feeders. Red-winged blackbirds change their diets with seasons. They are known to hang out uh, on agricultural fields. They love corn, which has actually soured their relationship with farmers and has been contributing to their population decline. So in the winter, their diet is mostly plants and seeds. And then during their breeding season, they tend to incorporate more bugs. They happily come to bird feeders, though unlike grackles, I find that they disappear from my bird feeders completely for about a month in the summer. They are now gearing up to migrate, so they are back here stocking up. 
earlier this year, I learned something new about red-winged blackbirds. Males are quite polygamous. They have been spotted with 15 females nesting in their territory. Male red-winged blackbirds are very territorial. They establish their territory as soon as they arrive at their breeding grounds. It's about one square mile, but females are actually not that innocent either. They have been caught having fun with one male and then going to nest in another male's territory. Red-winged blackbirds breeding season is from late March until mid-May. Females build their nests super fast, three days and she's all done. Though I find some of the nest locations are super precarious. It looks like the nest is gonna fall down any time. Some of the studies that were conducted on red-winged blackbirds found that 40% of their eggs and their chicks are lost to predators. So you think that these birds will have either large clutches or would have multiple broods during their breeding season, but no, it's three eggs on average and only one brood. And in areas where daddies decide to help feed the young, the chicks actually grow to be stronger and heavier. Well, goodbye for now. Just a quick reminder that our photo contest is still open. It's mockingbirds and threshers. Have fun sharing, finding native plants in your area. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.